on the plane here, two planes I had to change in Singapore, I was thinking, what a very crucial time that we're living in. I often point out a statement by an economist which can be applied to all the problems affecting the world today and our role in handling those problems. He said a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And being amongst you all, observing you the past day and a half, I see hope. Materially, not much is working these days. There's a phenomenon of intersectionality, multi-crises all converging at once. And you might think, what can the chanting of Hare Krishna, what can this bhakti do in the face of such massive problems. One survey comes to my mind done by Stanford University and a university in the UK, so very top level survey of persons between the ages of 18 and 33 in 10 countries of the world, including the USA, Canada, Australia, India, astonished by the results of this survey, which gave such insight into what the pivotal generations present on Earth now think. 82% said that the future doesn't look good and they're full of anxiety. 53% said humanity is doomed. And 33% said we don't want to have children. We don't want to bring children in a, into a world like this. In the face of such massive problems, what can Bhakti do? This was an issue I faced when I was 21. Just graduated from Yale University, supposed to know everything. And I realized I knew nothing. <laughs> How does bhakti relate to the problems of the world? We first have to understand what is the real problem before we set out to solve the problems. We're facing a crisis brought about by toxic consciousness. Unless there is some process for transforming the heart, we'll not find a way out of these multiple crises affecting the world. The crises are the result of lack of access to lifestyles that will actually purify the consciousness. So this is what I was thinking about on the plane here to India. And then I find myself amongst you all and I feel that by such events, by such gatherings, we can all experience what is the actual solution. It may seem impossible. How can we initiate such an inner transformation that will change the world? But as you know, we need to be the change that we want to see in others. And once we 
cross that bridge and realize what transforms our heart can also transform someone else's heart. Then you see the path for success. Amidst this human crisis, you can remember an old Chinese saying. Many people think it's a blessing. The Chinese meant it as a curse, but we can take it as positive. May you live in interesting times. We can take that as a positive encouragement because these are certainly very interesting times we're living in. And this gathering reinforces the practicality of bhakti because you can feel the power of heart transformation. So this bhakti process is not pie in the sky. It is dealing with ground reality, what goes on in the core of our being. The bhakti flavors that you're tasting are from out of this world, but they can enter into this world and transform this world. Those are just a few thoughts I'd like to share with you. Thank you very much. His Holiness Deva Marita Swami Maharaj Aki. That was poignant and beautiful, wasn't it? Yeah. So well spoken. Before we introduce Radhana Swami, he needs no introduction, obviously. We've spent so much time with him, but let's just take a, a moment and appreciate where we are. Now one person's dream to serve his guru has created this oasis in the middle of crazy India. <laughs> and if you were born in the Govardhan Eco Village and you've never left these walls, you're in for a surprise once you drive out that gate. But we really feel like we are being embraced and loved, and the atmosphere is divine. Something very powerful happens when one person is focused on giving instead of taking. And I'm really honored personally, and I'm sure I can speak for all of you, to have His Holiness in our life for this month. It's been incredibly powerful. They say that one moment association with the great soul can change the trajectory of your life. How many people agree with that? Say Harry Bowl. Yeah, it's happening. I've seen it happen to so many people. I've seen it happen to me. And I'm so uh, honored that Radha Swami has been in my life. And um, I pray that I can stay uh, rendering service. Maharaj, would you please come and enlighten us? We feel very dull, and we need you to breathe some air into our our foggy minds you light up our life Maharaj
ज्ञानाजनाचलाकाया चक्षुरु मिलिताम जेना तस्माइ श्री गुरवे नमः नमः ओम विष्णु पदाया कृष्ण प्रेष्टाय भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांडा स्वामीन इति नामिने Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Asyatyate Shatharine Banshakalpat Rubyascha Kripa Sindubya Evacha Patithanam Bhavane Bhyao Vaishnava Bhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Adwaita Gadadhar Shiva Sati Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Hare Krishna, 
Krishna Krishna Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari Hari Krishna, Krishna, Hari, Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, 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 Hari, Hari. Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Krishna, 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 Hari, Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, 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 Hari, Hari. to Bhakti Immersion. Sincere gratitude for His Holiness Devamrita Swami Maharaj's already realized, enlightened, insightful wisdom that He has shared with us. To all the teachers who have brought illustrious students to our Govardhanika village, Special gratitude to each of you. I'm actually, in my heart, I'm touching everyone's feet with with humble um, respects 
but physically I'm not able to manifest that. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Devamrita Maharaj was speaking about the opportunity of crisis. The human tendency is when we hear these things we want the types of crises that we like. But if they're not unbearable they're not actually a crisis. When we speak about taking shelter of God in difficult times, we like the difficult times to be according to our convenience or our choice. But if they don't hurt, they're actually not difficult times. As human beings, we don't order difficult times on the internet and <laughs> expect it to be delivered according to our um, choice. They will come anyway. That is the nature of this world. You know, there's certain destinies we just have to go pass through, and there's various tribulations due to the dualities and inevitable conflicts of people. Difficulties, the crisis caused by our own mind, how we interpret the situations that come in our life, the crisis that happens in our body. Too much heat, too much cold, too much dry, too much rain. Um, disease. That which is caused by other people or other living entities. And that which is caused by the by nature herself. So these things will come. Yoga, Dharma, true spirituality is not just having a healthier, more attractive physical body, which will inevitably be changed in time. But it's learning how to adjust our perception and our consciousness to actually grow toward ananda, or real happiness, through those situations. May I tell a story? Stories from Holy Scriptures are often extreme. Have you had that experience? Sometimes we almost think it must be mythological. It's just some type of allegory because, you know, how could we do that? But if we just do the right thing in a kind of ordinary way, it's easily forgotten. But when people do it, when God stages it <laughs> in a very extreme way, we may not be able to imitate it. But it establishes a standard that we can aspire for. So long ago, in the ninth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, we learned there was a king named Ranti Dev. Please raise your hand if you 
know the story of Ranti Day. Please raise your hand if you do not know the story of Ranti Day. Please raise your hand if you'd like me to tell you the story of Ranti Day. <laughs> He's a king. And he saw everyone as a child of God. He saw everything as the sacred property of God. And he did not consider himself to be the ruler, he considered himself to be the custodian, the, the, the servant of what is dear. And he ruled, he did rule, but with that kind. So for the sake of the people of the world, he was trying to purify not only himself to be a more empowered instrument of God's grace, but he wanted to also be an example for others. He fasted. For 48 days without a morsel of food or a drop of water. And that was the limit of what he could do. And while he was, he wasn't just sitting and fasting, he was utilizing all of that energy to take shelter of the Lord, and he was praying for the Lord's mercy, blessings, and grace upon every living being. Because he cared about everyone in, in his kingdom like a father does for a child. And when mothers see children in crisis situations, how much does a mother pray for her child? Even if she doesn't believe in God, she'll pray for her child. <laughs> because she's just a well-wisher. He was everyone's well-wisher. He was trying to cleanse himself and invoke blessings through his fasting and through his yagya. He was doing yagyas and all of this so that God's blessings would be upon everyone. And after 48 days, he was actually on the verge of leaving his body, which is kind of a Indian way of saying dying. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and actually, his whole family believed in him so much that they all fasted with him. So yeah, he's a king, and he's in a very secluded place where there's nothing around, really, in the forest. And somebody from a distant place brings a wonderful um, feast of prasad. A food. And he's about to break his fast and eat. And a Brahmin priestly person, a teacher. He came from 
out of the forest into this little place where Ranti Dave was as a guest. And immediately Ranti, he's, he bowed down and offered all respect from his heart and gave the Brahmin food. According to the scripture, the Brahmin didn't even ask for food. But just to welcome a guest, he offered him whatever he liked. And along with the Brahmin, he fed his whole family. And then he was, then the Brahmin, after they spoke for some time, and he left. At that time, just a very common person who just works the fields, he came as a guest. He just walked, and Ranti Dev immediately, seeing God in everyone's heart, he bowed down. He's the king. You're supposed to bow to the king, at least. That's tradition in those days. He was bowing, and he fed that person to his full satisfaction, and he left. He sat down to eat, and another guest comes. This guest was surrounded by really hungry dogs. And this man said, my dogs and me are very hungry. Please, king, give us food. The dogs were real hungry. He bowed to the paws of each dog. Want to speak of the guest. They were all guests. And he fed them all to the full satisfaction, and they ate Everything. There was nothing left. You know how dogs could lick plates and stuff? You know? <laughs> there was nothing left. <clears throat> All there was was one cup of water. And it was just enough to keep him alive. He was trembling. He was just about to drink the water. But before he could, another guest came. This one is, this was a person who was actually just, he was outcasted by the society for so many reasons. And he was really in a pathetic state. And he cried out, to Ranti Dev, O oh, King, kindly give me some water. In his heart of hearts, he was bowing to everyone because he, he was seeing this truth. And to the degree we're actually enlightened, to the degree we're actually realizing the idea of yoga, connecting the body, the mind, the consciousness of the heart with the soul, we're able to recognize who we are. We're a divine part of God. Sarvasya Chaham Ridhishani Vishnu. And Krishna, God is within, the Paramatma is within the heart of every living being. So wherever we see life, the presence of the soul, the jiva, the atma, and the presence of the witness, the supreme soul, Paramatma, is there. Whether it's a tree, or grass, or an insect, or a reptile, a bird, all varieties of animals, and most difficult, all varieties of humans. How to perceive that potential, that essence? If we don't see it in ourselves, we can't see it in others. 
And if we're not seeking to see it in others, we can't see it in ourselves. The process and the goal of the process are very harmonized with the same spirit. Ranti Dave was holding that cup of water and he offered a prayer. This is one of the most celebrated prayers. He said, I do not pray to the Supreme Personality of Godhead for the eight mystical yogic perfections. I do not pray to the Lord for liberation from the sufferings of this world. I only pray that I'm allowed to live among the suffering people of this world so that I could relieve them of suffering. And then he prayed, by offering this water to this very poor man, I will be forever free from thirst, from hunger, moroseness, anxiety, or illusion. He didn't only say it, but he took the cup of water and gave it to the man. And the man immediately drank it all. Now there's nothing. Shukadeva Goswami, who's narrating the story in Srimad Bhagavatam, he tells that Ranti Dev's prayer, his words were Amrita Bacha which means they were words of nectar. Now in the Sanskrit texts, the idea of nectar is not the way we use it today. This is nectar because it tastes good. But actual amrita, it nourishes us with such a higher taste of the experience of the divine, of, of God's grace, that we're fully satisfied. It heals us. It gives us everlasting joy. That's what Amrita means. So he's giving this water to this very, very poor, desperate person. But in his helpless prayer, it's an amrita for all living beings for all time to come of those who hear it with receptive hearts. And then that person just drinks the water and goes. Doesn't even say thank you. And King Ranti Davis, he's so grateful this man is allowing me to serve him. He's allowing me to die for his welfare. What a great service to God he's giving me. How many leaders do we know who are like this? But this is the example. To hold on the pedestal of the altar of our aspirations to follow in the footsteps. Bhakti, Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught that the path of pure bhakti is Mahajano Yenakadasa Bandha. Not to imitate great persons. Because if we try to imitate, we'll probably die. <laughs> because we, or we'll go, we'll get depressed, or we may even go insane. Because <laughs> there. But to follow the principles and the values that they live by. That's the way of perfection. So 
So at that moment, devatas, demigods, Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, and others, they appeared and told Ranti Dev that we all disguised ourselves as all your guests. because we want to show the world what real greatness is through you. And they gave him food <laughs> and they gave him water. And so he lived. Now because Ranti Dave was so much a well-wisher to everyone, it is described in the next verses that the whole kingdom, everyone, loved God because they saw what love of God actually really is. It's real compassion. They saw that love of God is not judging people. Love of God is seeing the potential in everyone and being willing to live and die for the well-being of others because, because Krishna, God, is in their hearts. Paradukha dukhi. That greatness is measured by the willingness to make to see other people's suffering as your own and other people's happiness as your own. Now in the world today, as His Holiness Deva Mrita Swami Maharaj was speaking, if we're seeing the other, if we're feeling the other people's suffering as our own, how much suffering is in this world? How many wars? How much disease, how much abuse, how much hate, how much greed, how much poverty, how much hunger. You know, if we come out of the little bubble of, you know, our own locale, and look at the world itself and, and care about the world and we're suffering for other suffering we're going to really be suffering yet the great souls who are doing this they're experiencing the highest happiness now from a materiological perspective that is a contradiction but from a spiritual perspective, the more we actually care with God in the center, the more we see, the more we want to help. And the more we want to help, the more we know how limited we are. So we take shelter of the higher power of grace. And in taking power, taking shelter of that higher power to heal and help others, then we get filled with amrita, with nectar. Janavi, Jiva Devi, and Gorani Prabhu, and Bali, and Kishor, and Shameshwari were doing such beautiful kirtan when we came. The holy names of God, these mantras, are actually amrita. The beauty, the sweetness, the love, the grace of God is being accessible through, these, through the sound vibration. And according to how we're taking shelter to receive, we actually become filled with nectar. process when we really want to be well-wishers of others and we we're so motivated 
beyond just our own solving our own problems. We're, we're motivated f to be an instrument of a higher love to heal the world. But it takes feeling the suffering of the world to, to actually do that. <laughs> And the more we do that, the more we feel the suffering, the world, and the more we want that. And in that loving exchange of God's grace that we're receiving from Him and sharing on behalf, there's Amrit, there's Ananda, there's nectar, there's actual true happiness. That was Ranti Day. Therefore, everybody practically they all loved God. They all liked each other. <laughs> they weren't exploiting the resources of nature. Because they actually felt real hope from seeing someone who's living in this way. And although there may be millions of people not living this way, if we could connect to God's grace through even one person, how grateful we should be. How hopeful we should be. How blessed our life could be. When our beloved teacher, Srila Prabhupada, when he came to the West from Vrindavan. Actually, Kovardhan Eco Village, have you been to some of the places that represent Vrindavan? If you think you haven't, you are at this moment, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we tried because in this world things change um, but we tried to to replicate little miniature um, except this place is actual life size but we tried to um, in memory and separation from Vrindavan um, present the way Vrindavan was when Srila Prabhupada lived there in the 50s and the 60s. And when I was there in 1971, it was actually the same as the 50s and 60s. But some decades later, it started really developing. And the forests are not there so much. But Srila Prabhupada was living in the most peaceful, sanctified, holy place in creation. He got on that cargo ship 38 days across seas to come to live in the Bowery in New York in 1965. And he didn't even have a home and he didn't have money. He didn't know anybody except to you know, somehow or other made contact with a, a yoga teacher, Dr. Mishra. And other than that, why? So many challenges, so many disappointments, so much betrayal. But in all of it, the more there's difficulties and problems, there's more a need for us to contribute. That's what it actually means to be a well-wisher. Being a well-wisher mean, doesn't mean um, being a what do they call it in Britain? A fair weather friend. <laughs> that, you know, when things are nice, I'm your friend. When things are not nice, you know, I'm, I'm busy. 
think, well, we're sure things, things are nice, we're sharing it. And if things aren't, we're there. Sukritam Sarva Bhutana. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells, I'm in everyone's heart. I'm also living in this spiritual world as the all-pervading Brahman beyond and in every Vaikuntha planet, the spiritual planets of the spiritual world, I'm living in my eternal form, Satchitananda, performing pastimes with my devotees forever, pastimes of love. And he declares, I am Every living being in all spiritual and material worlds, everyone's well-wishing friend. Just waiting for us to receive that friendship and to share that friendship with people who really need friends. Bhagavad Gita tells Brahma Bhuta Prasana Mara Nasochati Nakamshati Samasaraveshu Bhuteshu Mad Bhaktim Lavate Bhara. Brahma Bhuta Prasana One who actually is on the state of consciousness of Brahman, spiritual awareness, is Prasana is joyful. When there's so much suffering and you're feeling the suffering in this world, how could you be joyful? Because when we're, when we're connected to the source of all joy and we're trying to share that joy because we really care, that's the ultimate joyful. Ranti Dev, in his prayer that we recited earlier, he I do not want liberation from suffering. I don't want eternal... fulfill what you're asking, you probably wouldn't read that prayer. But he meant it. Krishna doesn't see just what we do, and he just doesn't hear what we say. He does that too, but he also is completely aware of the intentions in which we do it. And this is bhakti, where our words and our actions and our intentions are in harmony with the ever well-wishing friend within our heart. So Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma, one who is in Brahman, is joyful. Nasochati Nakangshati. This is special effects. <laughs> hmm? They sound um, enthusiastic. <laughs> Nasochati Nakangshati means because we're experiencing a higher taste from within ourselves, we are neither hankering for the things of this world, 
nor are we lamenting over what's lost or the complexities of life. We naturally feel, we may feel pain, but when we have good association and good wisdom and a good path to follow, then in that pain it motivates us to go deeper. Otherwise, the tendency, if we don't have that support, we lament. We become despondent, depressed. We feel hopeless. It's sometimes good to feel helpless, but not hopeless. Because when we're helpless, we reach out for help. And the help is always there if we reach out. Maybe not the way we select it. But through hearing, through association. Nasochati nakamshati. Because we're not, we're tasting an experience of life that's higher than the selfish hankerings and lamentings of this world. That's the next stage of what it means to actually be on the spiritual path. We become a well-wishing friend for everyone, like Ranti Dave, like the saints of all great traditions. This is the consistent quality. When I was on my search through so many different spiritual traditions, looking for meaning and truth in life, I found in my studies and in my meetings with various people who were actually really enlightened, the common quality of people from all different kinds of interpretations of God, but who were on authentic paths. The common quality was well-wishing compassion for others. And you can't actually have that unless you're seeking to genuinely be humble. Because if you're arrogant, then it's just about you and taking credit. And if you're humble, it's about an instrument of a higher power to, to uplift others. That's actually what real humility is. And then a friend of all living beings and Brahma Bhuta Prasanna Mana Sochati Nakangshati Sama Sarveshu Bhuteshu Mat Bhaktin Labhate Param. And Krishna tells in the last line of this verse when you do all those things, then you are practicing bhakti. So bhakti is not just a sentimental idea that um, it means devotion, it's the yoga path of devotion. In the Bhagavad Gita, bhakti is this level of love, of compassion. And bhakti yoga is the path to reach that level of love and compassion. And it's very much accessible when we have a sincere intent in our heart and we come together with like-minded people who are who either are enlightened with this level of consciousness or who are seeking not liberation or mystic perfections but prema, divine love.
and to hear, to hear this wonderful wisdom, these wonderful stories, these wonderful teachings, these wonderful examples, that even in the darkest night become like our North Star, that we know which direction to go. And when we hear, then we have the opportunity among such sadhus or satsang to chant. Param Vijayate Shri Krishna Sankirtana Satatam Kirtayanto Mam Yadanta Krishna tells in Gita, my devotee is always aspiring to chant my names in glory. The Supreme Truth, God, has many names. And the Lord descends, incarnates within this world in the sound vibration of those names. And what is a mantra? It's a special combination of these names that give tremendous potency. So Lord Chaitanya, of all the Vedic literatures, he took this from the Kali Santara, Santarana Upanishad. He took this Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. You know, sometimes Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Inechi Oshadi Maya Nashi Boruladi, Hare Nam Maha Mantra, Lao Tumi Mahi. He's quoting Lord Chaitanya that I've come with a medicine that can actually cure the very core of the disease of suffering. It's this Hare Krishna mantra. <laughs> it's medicine. All the names of God of all great traditions are empowered with the presence of God. But this Maha Mantra is a special um, mixture of names that is of the highest potency for the problems of our consciousness today, individually and collectively. And the ways of the world they are what they are. And we need, according to our capacity, individually and collectively, to, to be an example, as um, Devamrita Maharaj was describing, to actually be the change we want to see. Because there's a whole lot of people complaining about things. And that's really easy to do. And sometimes the more we complain, the more we think we have authority. Because we can, what we complain about may be true or it may be not so true. Sometimes it's hard to tell. But to be the change. That's the challenge that actually gives us the opportunity to actually enter into greatness. Greatness is not about popularity or numbers of fans <laughs> or um, you know, how strong we are or how fast we are or how much money we have. Greatness is how God's, we take shelter of God's grace and our life is to be on behalf of Krishna a well-wisher to others and in this way to actually be a change. 
and knowing the power, the higher power of God's grace beyond our own intelligence, yes, we are hopeful. We can make a difference. If we can make a difference in one person's life, that's the most valuable thing in creation. If we can make a difference in 10 million people's life, that's also the most valuable thing in creation. We're just being the best we could be. That is bhakti. And we are here to immerse ourselves in this aspiration. I thank you very much. Shall we have kirtan? Would you like to dance? Because I talked too much, I made you sit for a really long time. But this, um, this platform under Madan Mohan Temple was specially designed for dancing. Can I tell you a story about this temple? Well, if you want to know the story of Madan Mohan Temple, I'm sure all your teachers will describe it to you. It's, you know, the deity of Madan Mohan was carved by Krishna's great grandson over 5,000 years ago. And over the centuries and the millenniums, he got lost. And then Adoitacharya, the avatar of Sadashiva, the original Shiva, and Mahavishnu, the creator of the universe, he found him in Vrindavan. And then it was given later to Sanatana Goswami. And Sanatana Goswami was just living under a tree, begging for some coarse wheat flour, and making little balls and putting them in the fire and mixing them with river water. And, and that's all. And then Madan Mohan was given to him. And he was living under a tree. And then a wealthy man with a boat came sailing by and um, his boat got stuck in the water in the Yamuna River. And it was hopelessly stuck. And all of his riches were on that boat to go to Agra to sell it. So he was helpless. So there he was in this remote forest in Vrindavan and he met Sanatana Goswami and Sanatana Goswami is, you know, feeding these little balls <laughs> of wheat <laughs> to Krishna. And seeing Sanatana Goswami, the wealth of his love and devotion, even though he was homeless, he used to be a great wealthy minister, but he left everything to be there. This rich man understood. I know what riches is now. And he accepted Sanatana Goswami as his guru. And he started hearing these same teachings that we're discussing and hearing about the beautiful pastimes of Krishna and Vrindavan and the saints. And then he was chanting God's names. And after some time, somehow or other, there was like, rains and the, the current of the Yamuna shifted and his boat was freed. So he went down and sold everything and came to Sanatana Goswami and said, everything I want to give to you. And Sanatana Goswami said, I don't need anything. I'm happy sleeping under trees on the ground. That's, that's my greatest happiness, just to be remembering Krishna. But Krishna should have a nice temple. So please make a nice temple for Krishna. So he built this temple. In Vrindavan. <laughs> we, this temple here is uniquely not unique. <laughs> it's actually a replica. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but when we decided to build this temple, it's a really long story that took many, many years, just the conception of it. But when we finally decided we, we wanted to build it over there, very close to 
um, Radha Vrindavan Bihari's temple, our main temple. But where we were going to do it was a tree, a Kadamba tree. And the only way to build a temple there, which everybody agreed this is the place, we'd have to cut down the Kadamba tree. So the question is, should we cut down the tree? That's the perfect place. So we all decided, no, we have to find another place. <laughs> we can't cut down this tree because Madan Mohan, we're doing it for his pleasure. We shouldn't begin the process by displeasing him because this tree has civil rights. <laughs> And uh, so we decided to do it here. But the problem here, it wasn't our property. <laughs> so we had to do all kinds of um, you know, legal property issues to, so that we could actually have this property and build it here, which we did. And it was just flat land. And Madan Mohan temples on a hill. Dwadasa Ditya Teal. Teal means hill. And the, the ground was kind of sloping downward in this direction. So we just got thousands of huge rocks and made a mountain. Really, I saw, I saw just taking rocks from rivers and from wherever we could find rocks. We were just getting huge rocks and, and just piling them on each other. And we made a whole mountain out of the rocks, and then we poured all kinds of stuff between the rocks to get them to stick together. And then we had like a mountain. <laughs> and we flattened it out, you know, with, you know, just pushing the rocks down and making, putting, you know, different type of, you know, stuff to make it flat. And then we built the temple on top of it. So sometimes you may be thinking, and actually they had to put that many rocks, whatever you see coming up from the ground over there, they had to put that many going down under it too, under the ground. They dug a huge hole in a low area and dumped thousands of rocks and then built on top of that. So sometimes when we dance in a temple, we're kind of afraid what it might do to the floor and <laughs> may cave in or the neighbors, you know, below us might complain. <laughs> well, here, I assure you, um, you can dance to the limits of your enthusiasm and everything will be very, um, what do they call it? In, environmental circles sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone please dance. As I'm chanting, please go like this. And as you're chanting, please raise your arms, reaching out for Sri Radha and Krishna.